uh, let's kind of just roll into this. We'll, let's see where the Holy Spirit goes with this tonight. But this is, this is interesting. Because, you know, we talk about, you know, we've, we've, we've come a long way since we started uh, the timeline. And come a long way, and God has showed us, shown us some, some really key things that we missed in the beginning. And yet, once he showed it to us, it totally makes sense. And, you know, what, what's really, uh, really profound that he's shown us lately is that the, the first fruit rapture, of course, is one like Paul had, that, that the man-child does not stay in heaven for you know, the remaining, remaining three and a half years plus 40 days or whatever, that he actually comes back just like Paul did. You know, Paul says, I was caught up to God and to his throne, and whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, right? And then he came back and began the church, uh, basically to the Gentiles, right? And um, so the, the man-child comes back and ministers to the woman and finishes what, Jesus and Paul started back there in the first century, right? And, you know, uh, the, the whole concept of a pre or mid-trib uh, rapture, rapture like we used to think it was, um, is, actually not, not, is actually not true, and, but it, it fits in the precedent that God laid down throughout history. Uh, for instance, in when the, the Jews were in Egypt and um, you know they, they left Egypt and they went through the Red Sea, right? Well, God didn't rapture them out. Uh, quite the opposite. They went through the Red Sea. They went to the wilderness, right? like you could call this the second exodus, maybe, or the last exodus. And their enemies were killed when they left, right? In this case, the enemies basically will receive the wrath down here, the wrath of God. But still, they went through it. They weren't taken out of it, right? And, you know, go to uh, Luke chapter 17 and in in a couple of other instances the same thing uh, happened God didn't remove his people he judged the people uh, around them right in in Acts 17 uh, in verse 26 he says and just as it was in the days of Noah so, it will, so will it be in the time of the Son of Man, you know, when, when Jesus comes back, right? 1726. It says, people ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage, right up until the day when Noah went into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Okay? Um, and so Noah stayed, him and his family, but the others were taken. They weren't taken up in a rapture. They were taken as in they were destroyed. They were killed, right? And it says, so also as it was in the days of Lot. People ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You know, Lot continued on. They were taken in judgment. All right? That is the way it will be on the day of the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let him who is on the housetop with his belongings in the house not come down to carry it away. And likewise, let him, him who's in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to preserve his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve and quicken it. He says, I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken. One will be left. Well, you get, you, you, in the body of Christ, you get this taught as, oh, see, one of them's left behind and the other one got raptured. Well, let's keep reading. 
There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and one will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Raptured? Hmm. Then they asked him, where, Lord? And he said, wherever the dead body is, there will the vultures gather together. See, he's talking about taken in judgment, killed, judged. That's what it means there. It doesn't mean rapture. Otherwise, why would he be talking about dead bodies and vultures? You see that? So the precedent throughout history, biblical history, would be that God's uh, people's enemies are destroyed, but they continue on, right, on earth. And even here, God's enemies are destroyed. Yes, God does actually catch them up here. But the, the earth are taken in death, right, in the wrath of God, in judgment. They come back and continue on. See? And it just makes a lot more sense. You know, it fits God's narrative, so to speak. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 19. And I think that is really important to see that. Because we're, it, see, it's confirmation is what it is. Revelation 19. It, it's confirmation in all that God has shown us. Um, it's so hard to get people to let go of the idea that this abomination of desolation is, uh, you know, when he goes into the temple here and declares he's God. You just, can, it's just, you just don't see anybody laying hold of that out there. And it's so sad because it changes everything and it brings a lot of confusion into the, God's timeline in the end. It, 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 just, it just totally wrecks it and just makes it a mess and then they make all these other assumptions. And, you know, the fact that God showed us that how important that is, that it's 1,290 days later, it's, it's just, it's really the key to understanding things. But in the end times, at the very end, and we're talking way down here. See, we're going to talk about this. Jesus and the troops return on white horses. Right? Well, you know, who are these troops? Well, you guys know who it is, but I'm going to show you why they are who they are. And see, they come back here at the very end, right? Battle of Armageddon, right? That's why they come there. Uh, so let's pick it up at verse 11, Revelation 19, 11. After that, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one who was riding is called faithful and true. He passes judgment and wages war in righteousness. His eyes blaze like a flame of fire. And on his head are many kingly crowns. And he has a title inscribed which he alone knows or can understand. He's dressed in a robe dyed by dipping in blood. In the title by which he is called is the Word of God, right? So this is Jesus, and he's coming back. Now, see, it, at this seventh trumpet, uh, when it says, you know, uh, the dead in Christ shall arise, First uh, Thessalonians 4, 17, the dead in Christ shall arise, and we who are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up with him, uh, with them in the air, right? I think those two words, alive and remain, are not uh, very passive words. They really mean something more profound than just being here alive in the flesh and, you know, remaining here on the earth. No, it means you're alive in the spirit and you remained in the service, Right? Because there's a whole lot of Christians here, a vast host, who uh, obviously are not really remaining too well. And uh, they go through the wrath of God. But, uh, see, a lot of people think that that's 
the second coming of Jesus, you know, because it says at the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11, verse 15, it says, he begins to reign. But that actually isn't his second coming. His second coming is 40 days later when he comes back after the wrath of God. Okay, we're going to look at that tonight. So, and it says in verse 15, uh, let's see, verse 14, and the troops of heaven clothed in fine linen, dazzling and clean, follow him on white horses. Well, some may think that the troops of heaven, you know, that, what is he, the Lord, Sabaoth, and what is it, how does it say he's the um, God of angel armies, Right? And that's what that is. He's the God of angel armies. Well, not here. Uh, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. But this is the troops of heaven. These are overcomers. These are people who are going to rule and reign with Jesus. Um, look, go back to verse um, 7. It says, Let us rejoice and shout for joy. Let us celebrate and ascribe to him glory and honor. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. Right? That's at the seventh trumpet. Well, no. Now, now this, this is not. Okay? The bride preparing herself is. Okay? But this is 40 days later. Okay? But, okay? But let's just, we'll go on here. His bride has prepared her. She has been permitted to dress in fine linen. Dazzling in white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now you see over there in verse uh, 14, he said, The troops of heaven clothed in fine linen. See that? See, these are not angels. These are those who prepared themselves. These are God's people who prepared themselves. Um, Yeah, well, let's read on. Troops of heaven, clothed in fine linen, dazzling and clean, followed him on white horses. He's on a white horse, they're on a white horse, right? Um, from his mouth goes forth a sharp sword, which he can smite the nations. And he will shepherd and control them with a staff of iron. And he will tread down the wine press of the fierceness of his, the wrath and indignation of God, okay? Well, okay, see right here, Jesus coming forth from his mouth, he has a sharp two-edged sword. Well, we know what that is, right? Hebrews 4.12, it's the word of God. He's called the word of God. They just titled him the word of God, right? And it says, uh, where he smite, he will shepherd and control them with an iron staff, right? Well, that only Jesus does that, right? Well, go to Revelation chapter 2. You know, the one of the churches there, I think it's in chapter 2, 3 maybe, you know, he, he says he... He who overcomes uh, shall be clad in, in uh, white, right? He will walk with me in white. He who overcomes. But in Revelation 2, verse 25, hold fast what you have till I come. He who overcomes and who obeys my commands to the end, I will give him authority and power over the nations. Right? He shall rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken. And um, his power over them shall be like that which I myself received from my father. Right? And I'll give him the morning star. Okay, you see that? So Jesus, go back to Revelation 19. Here's Jesus. He rules them with a rod of iron. Right? It says it right there. It says Jesus does it. He will Shepherd and control in, in nations with a, a staff of iron. Okay? But he said, he who overcomes, they will too. And he says, their power shall be like the power I received from my father. Same thing. Right? You know, when, 
when Jesus comes back in, in the the, those who have prepared themselves, those who have overcome, you know, he says, when, in John, uh, 1 John 3, 2, he says, when, when we see him, we shall be like him, right? Okay, so here's Jesus coming back on white horse. He's got the troops of heaven coming on white horses. He has a rod of iron. He says, if you overcome, I'll give you a rod of iron. Right? They're in fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. Okay? They're made like him because they see him as he is. Remember, this is after the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? They're caught up to God and to his throne. Right? They're at the seventh trumpet. And ten days later, you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? And look at him on the next page. He, he says... Uh, in Revelation 20, verse 6, blessed is the person who, takes, uh, person who takes part in the first resurrection. Over them, the second death exerts no power of authority, but they shall be ministers of God and of Christ, and they shall rule with him for a thousand years. Well, what are they going to rule with? They're going to rule with a rod of iron, and they have power like Jesus had Received from the Father the same way. See, and see, what the church really has lost, of course, we've been over this thousands of times, but what the church has really lost over all these uh, hundreds and hundreds of years is the fact that Jesus didn't just come to save your souls, to save you from uh, spending eternity in hell from just getting you simple salvation, right? What Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection was made the way, made the way, disarmed the principalities and powers that were arrayed against mankind because they fell. Jesus paid the sacrifice, okay? He, he met all the requirements so that we, through the Holy Spirit anointed word and that implanted in us would change us, transform us to be like him. That is our hope. That's the blessed hope. The blessed hope is for us to be changed and transformed to be like Jesus. Right? And so many people say that that's heresy. And that is ridiculous. It is not heresy. It's all over the Bible. All over the Bible. Right? Especially the New Testament. Okay? So here, the troops of heaven, they prepared themselves. They did the work that pleased him. They overcame. He gives them a rod of iron. They are like him. So why wouldn't they be with him coming back? He says they'll rule as ministers of God and Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so there, there's, there's my case for that. I mean, look at that in Romans chapter 8. It, it is just, it, it, it makes the, you know, the simple salvation message that's so often predominant in the body of Christ, it makes it so uh, anemic, you know, compared to what God really wants to do. Yeah, of course God wants to save you. He doesn't want you to spend eternity in the second death, the lake of hell, right? Yes, of course. But what he really wants is for mankind to become like him. That's what he really wants. That's what Adam was, right? And, you know, this in verse 19, Romans 8, 19, the whole of creation waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship, right? The, for the creation was subject to frailty, futility and frustration. I mean, do we not see that? I mean... We live in a fallen world. All of creation, nature and everything is subject to frailty and futility. 
not because of intentional part on it, fault on its part, but by the will of him who so subjected it. Well, why would God do that? Why did God subject it to that? Because what you're saying, he likes freedom more than control. He wants us to choose it, right? Adam and Eve chose the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil when he told them not to, right? But see, God wants us to choose him, and Jesus made the way for, to get that back. Uh, that nature itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and corruption and gain an entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. <laughs> you know, I mean, we've read this so many times. Uh, verse 23, not only creation, but we ourselves too who have and enjoy the first fruit of the Spirit, a foretaste of the blissful things to come. We groan inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies from sensuality in the grave which will reveal our manifestation, right? For in this hope, we were saved. See, in that hope, we were saved. Not in, oh, I'm going to go to heaven, and I'm not going to have to go to hell. That's so lame. I mean, thank God he does make that provision, you know, for people who do not overcome. But that's not God's highest and best, and it's not what he had in mind at all. This is what he had in mind, right? And, you know, you hear well-meaning people, really pretty savvy. I've been, I've been listening to this guy on the Internet, very savvy minister. And, 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 you know, this man too, you know, he goes through all the errors of, you know, the seven-day Advis, the Jehovah's Witness, and, you know, the, he gets to the dominionist, the, you know, dominion theology, and, and yeah, I get it. Uh, you know, that stuff is just, it, it's really, it's really wrong. They make some really bad assumptions. And then he throws in with, you know, all about the manifested sons of God. Well, I get it. I understand why he says that because it's like um, guilty by association. You know, when you have this charismatic part of the body of Christ that, you know, their wife is on the stage uh, clucking like a chicken and the pastor's walking around barking like a dog and the, the audience is, is, you know, in so-called holy laughter and all this nonsense and then they're the ones that are teaching the manifested sons of God and they don't know what they're talking about. And actually... I can see why dev the devil infiltrated the church and brought ridicule to that message because that's God's highest and best for mankind, right? And so he, he, Satan sends in Tobiah and, and uh, Sanballat and Geshem and all these religious spirits or these, these spiritual assassins or whatever you want to call them these, these, you know, spirit forces infiltrated into the church and why wouldn't he go after the manifested sons of God message? Because if the manifested sons of God come forth, Satan and all of his hordes, they're finished. And actually, we know that we read the back of the book and it's going to happen whether I'm one of them or you're one of them or we're not and it's somebody else, it's going to be somebody. It's going to be somebody. It'll at least be those 144,000, and probably those 144,000, and who knows how many of the women in the wilderness become manifested sons of God, become like Jesus, come back, right? On white horses to rule and reign as ministers of God. Kings and priests. Kings and priests. Right? That's, that's our priesthood. See, we're kings and priests. We rule and we intercede. You know, and there's a whole lot more to it than that. But look at 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2. Because 
all of this, ever since uh, Adam and Eve fell, it's all about warfare. And it's about spiritual warfare. See, Satan, right, the age-old serpent, you know, the accuser of the brethren, uh, he usurped the authority that God gave Adam over the earth, right? And ever since, it's been a war in the heavenlies, right? And ever since, everybody dies. Everybody has died since then, except Enoch and Elijah, maybe John, you know, there may be some we don't know about that are not recorded, but very, very few, maybe on one hand you could count, have not died. Ever since then, all human beings die. Well, that's wrong. That's a travesty. That's a, that, that is just, it's the worst. You know, and not only do they die, but they live in this, this world of confusion and perplexities and not knowing, you know, what is this all about, right? And see, God wants to change all that. He doesn't want anybody to be in the dark anymore. He never did want them to be in the dark. But this is what Satan did, and it's all about warfare. See, he's coming back on a white horse with a sword and a rod, and he's going to execute judgment on the earth, right? And, but we're the bride of Christ. And there's nowhere in there that talks about us being soldiers. We're the bride of Christ. Well, if we're the bride of Christ, and that's literal, then I'm a transgender, because Jesus ain't a homo. Right? I'm sorry to say that, but you get my point. No, there, it's metaphors. <laughs> you know? It's metaphors. Right? So, in, in 2 Peter 2... 2 Timothy, thank you, verse 3, take your share of the hardships and suffering which you are called to endure as a good first-class soldier of Jesus Christ, right? No soldier, when he gets in service, gets entangled in the enterprises of civilian life. His aim is to satisfy and please the one who enlisted him, okay? Okay? So God has called you to be a first-class soldier. You know, there isn't, there's not going to be one, not one of those uh, people as the man-child. Not one is not a first-class soldier. Not one. Every one of them are first-class soldiers. Right? It has to be that way. Because what we're in... Uh, is a war. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons. Right? Well, it, you know, if, if you're not a soldier, then what are you doing with, human we with uh, spiritual weapons? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? They're not physical weapons, but they're mighty before God for the overflow and destruction of strongholds. See, this is that rod. It's that rod of iron that God has called us to use. That's our weapon. But see, we don't carry our warfare according to the flesh. You never saw Jesus one time or the disciples or the apostles take up arms against people. They did not do it. Why? Because God called them to be spiritual warriors. Spiritual. He came to save everybody, not to kill people. Right? He came to save. He could have when they came to get him and they said, you know, are you he? And he said, I am. And the soldiers all fell on the ground just from what he said, and he was holding them back. He could have sent them around the earth. 
But he wouldn't do that because he wouldn't do anything the Father wouldn't have him do. You see, Jesus uh, he, he says that he came that we might have light, right? The thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly, right? Inasmuch as we refute arguments, theories, and reasonings, and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ. See, it's a spiritual war. And the war has to do with truth. Truth, the word. Not, not moral relativism, truth. That's what it has to do with. Defending the truth or fighting with the truth. Because Satan, he has twisted everything. I mean, look at the world we live in. The world is you get all you can, you can all you get, you get the biggest ego you can, might makes right. If you're rich, you're righteous. If you're poor, you're unrighteous. It's all backwards, every bit of it. And it's it's destroying mankind year after year after year for millennia, right? That's why he's come back. He says he's the word of God, right? Being in readiness to punish every disobedience when your own submission and obedience are fully secured and met. See, it has to start with us. Um, you know, well, let's, let's just nail it down. Go to Ephesians 6. See, what I'm nailing down here is that you're a soldier, and you're a first-class soldier, right? Or you won't be an overcomer. It's what it's all about. But we always do it in love. See, love conquers everything. He says, above all, love one another, Right? Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord, verse 10, draw your strength from him, put on God's whole armor, the armor of a heavily armed soldier, which God supplies. Remember, this, these are not carnal things, they're spiritual. That you may abide, uh, able successfully to stand up against all the strategies and deceits of the devil. See, it's a war. It's a war. Strategies and deceits. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness. Against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly sphere, they're put on God's complete armor. You may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day, having done all to stand to stand, right? And he goes on down about the breastplate and, you know, the feet and the helmet and all this. You know, the, this is a military thing. Why? Because we're in, we're in God's army, right? And see, these troops of heaven, these are, these are human. These are overcomers. They're created into the image of Jesus. Because they remained first-class soldiers. They overcame, right? And they're going to rule with him. They have a rod of iron, too. They rule, too. They have his power, too. And they don't ever die again. They put on immortality. This is what I'm telling you. It's so much bigger than anything you've ever imagined. Go back to uh, Revelation 19. Yeah, I know y'all know this, but it's good to hear it, and, and there's some people on the internet that need to hear it. Revelation 19, 15, From his mouth goes forth a sharp, to it, a sharp sword, which he can smite the nations. He will shepherd and control them with a staff of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and indignation of God, the Almighty. On his garment and on his thigh, his name is entitled King and Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, 
on his, uh, okay, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then a single angel stationed in the sun's light. Well, let's, let's do this first. Hold your place there and go to Revelation 14. You know, he's treading the wine press. Well, what is that? Well, in verse 8, he says, Fallen, fallen, Babylon the great, she has made, who, she who made all nations drink of the maddening wine of her passionate unchastity, right? And he, he says, uh, in verse 15, Another angel came out of the temple sanctuary, calling with a mighty voice to him who was sitting upon a cloud, Put in your scythe and reap for the nation for the hours arrived to gather the harvest, for the earth's crop is fully ripened. So he put for so he who was sitting upon the cloud swung his scythe and on the earth, and the earth's crop was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, also carrying a sharp scythe or sickle, and another angel came forth from the altar. The angel uh who has authority and power over fire, and he called a loud cry to him who had the sharp scythe, put forth your scythe and reap the fruitage of the vine of the earth, for its grapes are entirely ripe. What, God's in the wine business? No. <laughs> this is metaphors for people, right? So the angel swung his side on the earth and stripped the grapes and gathered the vintage from the vines of the earth and cast it into the huge wine press of God's indignation and wrath. And the grapes in the wine press were trodden outside the city and the blood poured from the wine press, reaching as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 200 miles. Okay, this is God's wrath. Right? Well, Jesus and the troops, you know, I have them right here on the end. Actually, it's right inside there. It's right at the end. I'll show it to you in just a minute. Armageddon, right? He puts hooks in their jaws and brings them across the Euphrates River, right? And they surround the city. Uh, go back to verse nine, chapter 19. They surround Jerusalem. Verse 17, Then I saw a single angel stationed in the sun's light, and with a mighty voice he shouted to all the birds that fly across the sky, Come and gather yourselves together for the great supper of God. That's not the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the great supper of God. That you may feast on the flesh of rulers, the flesh of generals, captains, the flesh of powerful and mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all humanity, both free and slaves, small and great. Right? This is the marriage, I mean, the uh, supper, great supper of God. This is that <clears throat> thing. And then I saw the beast and the rulers and leaders of the earth with their troops mustered to go into battle and to make war against him uh, who is mounted on the horse and against his troops. And the, the, my whole point to, for making all this is, see, it's, this is such a big game changer. These troops are God's overcomers. Created into Jesus' image, they hold the rod of iron, and they come and do this war at the bottle of Armageddon. They're involved in it. See that? I never really saw that before. I thought, well, Jesus is going to do it all, you know. you know. He smites them with the sword of his mouth. No, we're involved in that war against the armies of Antichrist and Gog and Magog and all that stuff. Wow. Eh? See, they come against him who is mounted on the horse and against his troops. Wow. Wrong move. By then, you look at yourself now and you go, no way. No way. But I'm telling you, what God's called you is so much higher than what you are now, it's not even funny. 
Then it'll be way and you'll be victorious. See, you put on immortality by then. You're like him. And the beast was seized and overpowered, and with him the false prophet, who in his presence had worked wonders, performed miracles by which he led astray those who had accepted or permitted to be placed upon them the mark of the beast, and who had paid homage and gave divine honors to his statue. Both of them were hurled alive into the fiery lake that burns and blazes with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword that issues from the mouth of him who is mounted on the horse. And all the birds fed ravenously and glutted themselves with their flesh. Right? Have you ever thought that you're going to be there? Well, you are. You're going to be there. If you remain a first-class soldier. Right? If we do that, if we go all the way, you're going to be there. I'm telling you, this is real. This, this is not a metaphor. This is not a, right, it's not a fairy tale. This is the real thing. Look at Psalm 110. I mean, what God has called us to is so heady. It's so amazing. But it's real. Psalm 110, the Lord God says to my Lord Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your adversaries your footstool. The Lord will send forth from Zion the scepter of your strength. Rule then in the midst of your foes, now and then. See, it's a scepter. You have a scepter now. You do. We've been using it this week, and it's been good. And if we didn't have it, we'd be like everybody else and just, you know, losing your people will offer themselves willingly in the day of your power. See, that's a soldier. In the beauty of holiness and in holy array. See, they're in order. That's a soldier. The beauty of holiness. Sometimes people don't know what they're looking at. Wow, you, you look good. Why do you look so good? Hmm. Something wrong with something's going on with him. He must be up to something. To you will spring forth your young men who are as the dew. The Lord has sworn, sworn and will not revoke or change it. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right? Kings and priests. See? It's not the same priesthood as the Levites. This is the order of Melchizedek kings and priests. That's what God's called us to. The Lord at your right hand will shatter kings in the day of indignation. Right? You know, what did he tell the Laodicean church? You know, he said, oh man, you guys are wretched. You think you're rich and you're poor and you're pitiable and you're poor and you're blind and you're wretched. And he said, but if you will repent, I will have you to sit down beside me on my throne as I sat down beside my father on his throne. Well, where's God, where's Jesus' throne going to be? Right there. Right there. The temple cleansed and restored in Jerusalem. He's going to have you sit down beside him and rule with him. Wow. Wow. But see, it's a war. He said, the Lord at your right hand will shatter kings in the day of his indignation. Right? That's what the white horses and the troops are about. Right? He will execute judgment upon the nations. He will fill the valleys with the dead bodies. He will crush the heads over lands, many and far extended. 
He will drink of the brook, brook by the way, and therefore he will lift up his head triumphantly. This is reality. This is what God's called us to. That's why I say, yeah, they're caught up to get a message, to get an anointing, to, to get God's assignment. They come back. They don't stay up. They don't even know if they're in the body or out of the body probably, just like Paul. They go all the way through it because we're in a war. God don't run and he don't have his kids run. He has them face it and he provides what everything they need. But you have to be a good first class soldier. Otherwise, you're just going to go the way of mankind. You're just going to die. Just like everybody else, you'll be in heaven. But it, was, it isn't God's highest and best. And see, we look at ourselves and go, why ain't nobody God? He goes, I know. That's what I want to use. I want to use what the world calls nothing. I'm going to confound them all. See, I don't want you to think you're somebody because you're not. The, the fact that you go, I don't not nobody, you're right. You ain't nobody. You're just a regular guy. He says, but I called you. And you can do what I tell you to do. You can do it. In and of yourself, you can't do it. I get this understanding, and I'm like, I'm excited about it, but I'm excited because he's given me revelation. But when I think about it in my mind, in my natural mind, I just go, uh, tilt, that ain't, that, that's impossible, God. You know, and he doesn't just stop thinking that way. Go back to the way I think. Don't think like you think. Just put that aside. You need to deny yourself on that one. Put that aside. That's your old man, and I've called you to be something greater than anything you've imagined. And we don't deserve it. No one does. It's God's grace, right? Jesus made the way for everybody, right? Uh, go to Acts chapter 3. I was going to do the Ezekiel 37 and 38 and all that, but it's just too long, so let's go to Acts chapter 3. And, uh, you know, it, it fits perfectly with this. Actually, Ezekiel 36 to 39, uh, there's, it's so rich when you see this. When, when you see what God has shown us and you plug it in now, I mean, he talks about the dry bones, right, of Israel. And he says, this is the whole house of Israel, right? And then he puts, you know, sinew and everything on the bones, right? And, and then, I'm, I'm, let me read that little part to you because it's just too good. I'm telling you, it's so prophetic. It's so, oh, it's just, it's mind blowing. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, 37 11. These bones of the whole house of Israel behold. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are completely cut off, right? which they did to themselves, right? Right? So they're the olive tree, right? And they've been, they're cut off, right? But see, God's turning that around for the sake of their forefathers. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Will you remember there? Hold your finger there. Go to Matthew 27. I think it's 51. 52. Yeah, Matthew 27. We'll start. I'll let you get there. <laughs> I mean, it's just too good. We'll go 2750. Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. You know, he said, it is finished, right? And so you got people out there that are, they call themselves preterists in the Bible, and that means everything that the law and the prophets prophesied 
when Jesus said it is finished, that it was all completed, it was all fulfilled. Well, that's just baloney, right? I'll prove that to you in just a minute. There's so much. And at once the curtain of the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep in death were raised to life. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Wow. That is the power of the resurrection. Now go back to Ezekiel 37. I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves. Right? Oh, my people, and I'll bring you to the land of Israel. Well, look at this. The dead in Christ shall arise first. Right? 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them. He opens the graves. The whole house of Israel. See that? See, and he brings them into the land. Yeah, 40 days later. It's just a mere 40 days. But he brings them to the land to, because they're his people. But now, right, Gentile and Jew, it's one body now. It's that way already. But it will be that way then because they have gotten an agreement and they get grafted in. Right? Wouldn't you want you to miss this hidden truth, brethren? A hardening has befallen a part of Israel to last until the fullness, the repletion, right, of the Gentile, not full number, the fullness has come in. Right? And so all Israel will be saved, it says. The deliverer will come from Zion. Right? And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of the graves, O people, and I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, and you shall know and understand and realize that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. Wow. Right? Look at in verse 22. And I will make you one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. And they shall no longer be two nations, not Israel and Judah, but one, not a house divided anymore, right? Oh, it's so good. But go to Acts 3. Acts 2, actually. Uh, no, where was that? Ah, I'm in the wrong book. Revelation ain't Acts. Ask me no questions. I'll tell you no lies. Okay. Acts 3.19. He's telling them, you know, he was confronting them, and he said, so repent, turn around and return to God, that your sins may be erased, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You know, if you've been messing around out there, and you've been messing around, and you ain't got refreshing, you got nothing but condemnation and misery, and I don't care if the word says there is therefore no condemnation, that those are in Christ Jesus, it says for those who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit, because if you're in Christ Jesus and you walk after the flesh, you will have condemnation. Satan will be sure you do. And actually, you deserve it. Because you did not meet God's requirements. I've been there a thousand times, at least. And so when you do, times of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. See, he didn't leave, you did that he may send you the Christ, the Messiah, who before was designated and appointed for you, even Jesus. Now listen to this. Whom heaven must receive and retain until the time for the complete restoration of all that God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets for ages past. 
All right? So, what is that saying? That when Jesus said it is finished, that didn't fulfill all that the, from the mouth of the holy prophets had said. It says that he, heaven retains and, and uh, receives him until the complete restoration of all that the prophet said. Right? See, when Jesus said he's finished, that part was finished. And man, he was just beginning. Man, that made the way for him to do what he really wanted to do. Right? And look, 2,000 years later almost, and people are still balking at it. Oh, you can't be like Jesus. You can never do that. Well, in and of yourself, you can't. But he said you could be if you would follow him. Right? I mean, it's there. The whole of creation groans and travails for it. In this hope we were saved, whom heaven must receive. Look at uh, Hebrews. I'll have to find it. I think it's chapter 5. No. Uh, let's see. What was that? Uh, trying to think of how it says it. Something like... Um, It's right here, hang on. Yeah, uh, verse 10, uh, chapter 10. Okay. Uh, verse 11, Furthermore, every priest stands at his altar of service, ministering daily, offering the same sacrifices over and over again, never to be able to strip aside the sins, and take them away, whereas this one, Jesus Christ, after he had offered a single sacrifice for our sins, that shall avail for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Then to wait, then to wait until his enemies should be made a stool beneath his feet. Right? See, he's waiting until his enemies are made a stool beneath his feet. See, enemies. We're in a war. It's a spiritual war with some very powerful beings. And God wants to use mere humans that he says, for by a single offering, he's completely cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated and made holy. See, in him, you're enough. Outside of him, you're a wisp of vapor. You ain't nothing. Right? But this is what God has done for us. Let's finish with this, Isaiah 11. And what he's going to do. I'm, I just What I just see here is that he is raising our sights. You know, <laughs> lift up your heads, O oh, ye gates. He's raising our sights. And he's, he's showing us, hey, look, this is way above your pay grade. <laughs> but I've called you to it, and you can do it. And if you'll stick with me, you're going to do it. I'm going to do it in you. Isaiah 11, 1, And there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, and a branch out of his root shall grow and bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding, 
and his delight shall be in the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, neither decide by the hearing of his ears. See, it's not carnal. But with righteousness and judge, justice shall he judge the poor and decide with fairness for the meek, the poor, the downtrodden of the earth. And he shall smite the earth and the oppressor with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall slay the wicked. Wow. See, he's called you to be like that. That's not just for Jesus. That's for you. That's for you. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. Wow. Well, Father, we thank you that you are showing us these things, that, that we have to get accustomed to it, and that we receive it by faith. And it's by your grace, and only by your grace, through faith. And we just believe it, Father. You show it to us, and we believe it. And, and we want to lay hold of it, and we want to be what you want us to be. In spite of all of our shortcomings, in spite of all our weaknesses, at, like Paul said when he was, had a thorn in the flesh, and you told him, my grace is sufficient. So we lay hold of that, Father, and thank you, and ask that you continue to deal mightily with each one of us that we can come to that place of full maturity in Jesus' name.